today we are joining you with three exciting talks. Uh, the first talk will be by Suchen Wang, uh, from, uh, who is a PhD student at the University of Montreal, and the uh, Gali Lab, who is going to present fully exploit hierarchical structure for self-supervised taxonomy expansion. The next one will be by Thomas Martin, who is a PhD student at UCAM, and his presentation title will be Leveraging a Domain Ontology in Neural Learning from Heterogeneous Data. And uh, the last talk will be by Thorsten Scholak, who is an Applied Research Scientist at ServiceNow, who is going to present text to SQL, SQL a translation with a dual rat. So without further ado, we are going to jump right to the presentations uh, with the first presentation by Su Chen Wang. But before we start, uh, I would like to, like every other meeting, I would like to encourage everyone to keep your, keep your microphones and your cameras off during the presentation so that everyone can enjoy the talk by the speakers. So Su Chen, the floor is yours. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. All right. And can you see my slides? Not yet. Yes, uh, you can see it now. Perfect. OK. Um, good morning, everyone. And this is Su Yuchen Wang from University of Montreal. And I'll introduce our work during my internship at Tencent Jarvis Lab. It is called Inquire One's Parent and Child Before Decision fully exploit hierarchical structure for self-supervised taxonomy expansion. This work was accepted at the web conference 2021, and it was done by Su Yuchen Wang and Bang Liu from Rally Lab and Mila, University of Montreal, and Rui Hui Zhao, Xi Chen, and Ye Feng Zheng from Tencent Jarvis Lab. First, I'll introduce the task of taxonomy expansion. The definition of taxonomy is a hierarchical knowledge graph modeling is a or hypernemy relations. It is widely used in e-commerce and academia, such as Amazon product taxonomy showing the categories of goods, or MeSH maintaining the hierarchy of research tags. However, expert curation of a taxonomy is time consuming, and taxonomies need to be updated continuously with new terms. Low coverage and inconsistency of taxonomy will hurt the performance of downstream applications. So the solution is to expand a human curated taxonomy with newly emerged terms rather than construct them from scratch. So for a downstream task, we can update the taxonomy in such a workflow. First, we concept, conduct concept mining, and then we expand uh, an existing taxonomy with the, with the new concepts. And then we use the expanded taxonomy for a downstream task. And for a more former definition of taxonomy expansion. First, a term n is a node in or to be added to the taxonomy. And it is with a surface name as its lexical feature. The C taxonomy T0 is the original taxonomy to be expanded. And it is treated as the model input and our source of the training data. And the query Q is the single new term to be added to the C taxonomy. An anchor A is a term in the C taxonomy that tries to be query's parent node. With the above definitions, now we can go to the definition of taxonomy expansion, which is for a given query Q, we iterate over all nodes in the C taxonomy as anchor A, and then we assign a score FAQ for each anchor. Then we select the single best anchor A star, which equals argmax FAQ as query's parent, in the expanded taxonomy. For previous solutions, we have several hypernemy detection models, which the input is just two terms, and we detect um, whether they are hypernemy relations. And it contains pattern-based models, but the rules and features curated by experts have low coverage. And for distributional models, they are hard to find the most suitable hypernemy in the taxonomy. For taxonomy construction models, they construct a taxonomy from scratch by a lot of mm, unrelated terms, which may introduce inconsistency by continuously reconstructing the taxonomy. And for existing taxonomy expansion models, some of them are supervised, which needs human labeled training data other than the C taxonomy. 
and for the relatively recently introduced self-supervised taxonomy expansion models, they generate training data from the C taxonomy. But the features in the hierarchical structure are not fully used in these models. Our model is to tackle the flaws of the previous solutions. First, in our model, we would like to add all relative nodes with query in the C taxonomy for explicit comparison. Here, by saying relative nodes, I mean they have two types. The first one is anchor and all ancestors of anchor. They should all be hypernames of the query. And the children of anchors would be the siblings of query. So they should share some similarity with the query. Thus, we designed the eagle tree structure. It contains the anchor, the ancestors of the anchor, and at most three sample children of the anchor. The sampling process guarantees abundant comparison while reducing computational cost. The input to the model contains Q and the eagle tree of A to test the query as a node inside the expanded taxonomy. Different from previous methods that generates node representation by averaging surface names word vectors for MLP classification, we would like to directly discover node pair relations by pre-trained language models. However, the information in the relatively short surface name is not enough. So we designed a simple description generation algorithm to expand term surface names into a description based on WordNet descriptions. The algorithm models the problem as a dynamic programming problem. First, it splits terms into longer noun phrases. Then it translates each noun phrase by its WordNet description. The full algorithm is given in the paper in algorithm two. And for each node in the input, we concatenate its description with query's description for a pre-trained distilled birth model to detect its lexical relation with query. The distilled birth will be fine-tuned in the training process. And on the right, I provide an example. The term is adaptation to climate change. And by our algorithm, we split it into adaptation and climate change, which are two long noun phrases. And then we find mm, suitable descriptions in the word net. Uh, since a single term might have multiple descriptions in the word net, we find the one with lowest cosine similarity with the root node in the taxonomy, which the root node in this, in this situation is environment. And then we concatenate all the, all the obtained descriptions into this one. Adaptation to climate change is the process of adapting to something to a change in the world's climate. And it is as the distilled birth input. Now for all nodes in the input, we have a representation of its lexical relation with query. Now we would like to test the coherence of the taxonomy. By saying coherence, First, it means it meets the previous standard that anchored and anchors ancestors are all queries hypernames, and anchors children share similarity with query, which is mentioned before. Besides, coherence also means taxonomy related designs curated by human. For example, in biological taxonomy, each absolute level has specific limits of the node, while in e commerce taxonomy, difference in relative level might indicate adding or removing a single adjective. We use a randomly initialized transformer to detect the overall coherence. Each token for transformer is a node in the input, and its representation is the sum of eagle tree representation, which is the output of hypernym detection module. The absolute level embedding, which is embedded absolute level in the expanded taxonomy, the relative level embedding, which is the embedded relative node level compared with Q in the expanded taxonomy, and segments embedding, which is zero if the node is anchor, one if the node is query, and two otherwise. The transformer has two CLS tokens, which are two outputs for the latter Pi's fender and stopper modules, respectively. We just said that coherence modeling module outputs two coherence representation of the input eagle tree. For the evaluation of coherence, the hierarchical structure allows two-dimensional evaluation. Path and level can be evaluated separately. The path finder acts as hypernym detector. It evaluates whether current path is correct. 
it takes the first CLS representation as input and output a pathfinder score for the eagle tree structure. And the stopper is designed to be a three classification module, which outputs three scores, evaluating which direction has better parents for the query. The forward score is the score that current scores, current anchor's children is better than the anchor. The current score is the score that current anchor is better than its parent and children. The backward score is the score that anchor's parent is better than the anchor. In the example on the right, Ulung is the query, and we show the tag for pathfinder and stopper, respectively. Then for the training process, we designed a self-supervised training process, which generates training data from the C taxonomy to perform self-supervised training. In each epoch, each, each node in the C taxonomy is regarded as query exactly once. And for each query, we sample these four kinds of nodes in the C taxonomy as anchors. Um, these four kinds of nodes contains all combinations of pathfinder and stopper tags, which are ground truth parents. Its uh, pathfinder score is one because its path is correct. And the current score is one because it's better than its parent and children. For the ground truth anchors ancestors, its pathfinder score is also one because the path is correct. And the forward score is one because its children are better than the current anchor. And for the ground truth anchors descendants, the pathfinder score is also one because the path is correct. And the backward score is one because its parents are better than themselves. And for other nodes, their pathfinder score is zero because their path is incorrect. And then we compute pathfinder score SP, the stopper scores, forward score, current score, and backward score, SF, SC, and SB. And for these scores, we compute a loss of LQ with multitask learning scheme. And we multiply them by eta and one minus eta for the, for the weight. And for the detailed pro proportion of the four kinds of nodes, and please refer to our paper. And then for the inference, we utilize the four scores computed before. For a single anchor node, we evaluate it we evaluate it by the product of the anchor's pathfinder score, which evaluates its root path selection. Anchor's current score from stopper, which evaluates its level selection. Its parent's forward score, which distinguishes the anchor from its parent. And one of its children's backward score, which distinguishes the anchor from its children. Since a node has multiple children, we select the children with mass pathfinder score since higher SP indicates better hypernemy relation with Q. And if A is root, SF parent AQ is assigned a small number, for example, 1E minus 4 for the first level is likely to remain unchanged. And if A is a leaf node, the SB CA star Q is, a, is assigned the proportion of leaf nodes in the C taxonomy to maintain the overall design. And the experiment settings, we use the benchmark semi-well 16 tax 13. It contains hypernemy-based taxonomy for three domains, which are environment, science, and food. Following previous work, the taxonomies are pruned to be trees. We take 80% of the nodes for training and 20% of the nodes for testing. The test nodes are all leaf nodes, and 10 test nodes are separated at validation set for early stopping. Our compared methods are hypernemic extraction solutions, which are BERT plus MLP and HypeNet, and taxonomy expansion solutions, which are Taxi. Taxi is the state-of-the-art solution for the semi well 16 tax 13 And Taxo Expand and Steam are the state-of-the-art ta mm, taxonomy expansion methods mm, introduced in 2020. And our metrics contain accuracy, mean reciprocal rank, and mean wu palmer similarity. On the right, we provide the statistics of the data set we use. And for the results of our main experiments, we can see that our proposed methods surpass previous methods by a large margin. However, the performance drops when taxonomy becomes larger. This means that we might need a more efficient self-supervised training design in our future work. 
And we also conducted some ablation studies. For ablation study, we removed several key designs in our model and test its performance on semi well 16 environment data set. We split them into two groups. The data flow group contains replacing WordNet descriptions with the term surface name. Use eagle nets in text expand to replace the eagle trees we, we, we introduced and remove relative and absolute level embeddings in the coherence modeling module. For a scoring function, we modify the pathfinder and stopper module to test only training, only training and using only stopper, only pathfinder scores and current score, or only current score. Our findings are the following. Use the, using descriptions for terms instead of surface names can largely improve the performance, especially for complex terms. Eagle trees enables modeling a complete hierarchical structure, thus improves the performance. Relative and absolute level features are important for recognizing different designs in coherence modeling. The path selection by Pathfinder and the comparison with parent children by Stopper all contributes to the performance. Compu compared to past evaluation, comparison with parent children is more crucial for selecting the best anchor. And the current only setting is identical to the simplest anchor query evaluation in the, in the prior arts and performance significantly drops. And for case studies, we select two correct cases and two bad cases. For the correct cases, we can see that the anchor's pathfinder score, the forward score from parents and the backward score from the selected child are all close to one with the current score of the anchor not too low. But for the bad case, we can see that the first one has incorrect description with its original meaning. So it is mistakenly connected to wine. And the second bad case is because our processing of leave nodes are inappropriate, that the correct anchor was given a low backward score from children, which I mentioned before. Uh, so these are all future works for our model. And for conclusion, for taxonomic expansion task, it is beneficial to model and evaluate all relative nodes in a hierarchy because both the hypernemy, which brings brought by parent and child relations and similarity brought by siblings can help for the task. And the second one is that injecting three exclusive features, the relative and absolute levels contains design of the taxonomy. And third, compare the anchor with its sibling, which is path selection and parent children with it, which is level selection, helps distinguishing similar nodes. And fourth, use descriptions for term, allows better input for pre-trained models and better understanding for rare and complex or new terms. For future works, for our model, we need to design a better self-supervision paradigm for large taxonomies to increase learning efficiency for path and level evaluation. And for module designs, we need to develop a more efficient implementation to use the above features. And for taxonomy related tasks, we need to design tasks and solutions for simultaneously adding multiple new terms. This involves adding non-leave nodes and considering relations among new terms. And the second one is discovering and modeling structure related features and characteristics to boost the performance of downstream tasks. And for, <clears throat> for the most state of the art taxonomy related problem, Currently, we have another task which is similar to the taxonomy expansion problem. This is called taxonomy completion. Instead of only, only enabling adding leaf nodes to the C taxonomy, this task enables adding non-leaf nodes to that taxonomy. It, mm, it replaces the anchor A into the candidate position, which is on the fourth row. The candidate position PC is two terms in the C taxonomy that tries to be queries parent and child. In this way, you can see that query is inserted between parent P and C. So query doesn't need to be a leaf node. So the task of ta taxonomy completion is for a given Q. It first iterates over all edges in the C taxonomy as candidate position. And second, they, the model assigns score at QPC for each anchor, uh, not anchor, each candidate position. And third, it ranks all candidate positions to select the top positions for Q to insert. The insert means that we re remove the edge PC and add two edges, which is PQ and QC. This task only have the, the this this 
single model, which is which was proposed in Triple AI 2021. It's called Triple Matching Network. It is a relatively simple model for the task, which mm, which is understandable because this means to be a baseline for the task. And the detailed introduction of this model is not the is not in in my talk. So if you are mm, interested in the task, maybe mm, using using our previous mm, introduced methods into this task can be a, an interesting future work as well. And that's all. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Sui Chen, for your very interesting presentation. So we're about five minutes ahead of the schedule, so we have about 15 minutes for the question by the audience. So if you want to ask questions, you can use the raise button option. So it's either like an uh, like a direct option in your toolbar, or it would be as part of the uh, reactions. So you have thumbs up and stuff, and there is also a raise hand. So you can use that option to raise your hand virtually, and I'll uh, be able to virtually pass the microphone to you. Dr. Bergler has a question. Dr. Bergler. Um, yes, hello. Um, this question may not uh, hello. be hello. It may not be entirely fair to you, um, but um, did this I'm I'm very pleased by your talk. I'm a little overwhelmed with all the little um, subscripts and all. I'm too slow to 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 really understand it all. Um, but it looks to me like there's several sort of time-honored ideas in here, which I find excellent to 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 bring into the new paradigm. And so my question is, if I understood correctly, what your algorithms currently do is the one that you did first was you insert a new node at the um, at the leaf level into a hierarchy. And yes. uh, in the second time, you allow it to be inserted anywhere in the uh, in the tree. Is that correct? Uh, no, that's another task which is called taxonomy completion. And the one I introduced in our webconf paper is called taxonomy expansion. The expansion task is only enabling adding leaf nodes, and the completion task is a more generalized task. So if you were to, let's say, you next, you incorporate completion into your extension, um, if I just look at that as, as um, um, just basically tree, um, basic tree algorithms, right? Um, yeah. Ultimately, you you want to rebalance your trees because ultimately something comes along that um, it, you couldn't have anticipated before, and you need to squish. So already the the the, the taxonomy completion does that to a certain amount uh, in terms of just placing the node in the hierarchy. But every now and then you you will need to reconstruct this being AI. You will need to reconstruct the hierarchy because a new feature. A, a, a new um, bit of knowledge becomes available to you. So if you want to go to your cafe latte or whatever, obviously this hierarchy is wrong because espresso has to be an ancestor to latte because latte is an espresso with milk. So once that comes to your, uh, currently the way you have your stuff, this, this being sisters to each other, espresso and latte, is all you could get from the data currently. Let's assume you go into data where this becomes this restructuring. Um, do you see these current techniques that, that you're going for going towards that as a next step organically, or do you feel that would break the paradigm? Mm, um, honestly, for me, the mm. task we have, which is taxonomy completion and taxonomy expansion, are all mm, relatively mm, too simple for the real mm, scenarios. Mm. Yeah. And the one you said that mm, not, not only we, we, we add a new term into the existing taxonomy, but also we reconstruct some of the relations. Mm -hmm. This seems, um, this is more, um, more, this is closer to the real scenario, but currently we don't have a um, benchmark for this. So it needs, needs uh, reconstructing the, the task. Mm -hmm. Yes. I wonder if you go over a big hierarchy, something like like um, mesh, 
hierarchy or something, and you train basically masking out, you know, not in a masking scheme, but basically just limiting certain notes. And so, yep. so the hierarchy looks different, whether you can sort of self-create data. Uh, Never mind. This is this is talking about the future. We should talk about your talk. But thank you very much. Found it very interesting. Okay. Thank you. So, do we have any other questions from the audience? I wish there was. I could have made a tutorial on how to do a raise hand because every time I log into Microsoft Teams, the feature changes on my side. And the way that you can raise your hands. So I'm also confused. So it might be also confusing for the audience. So if there is there is no question for now, I might want I might have a basic question. So basically, uh, taxonomy is not my my the domain that I'm very good at, and I don't have much experience. So my question might seem very basic. So you mentioned that uh, in order to uh, do the benchmarking of your system, uh, you uh, prune the graphs, the taxonomy graphs to form trees. So I was wondering if like this is uh, something that is required for your approach or is it something that is required in general? And uh, could you give mm. more information on that part? Okay. Uh, that's a very good question because uh, th this part is not detailedly introduced in our slides. And um, the reason why we prune a uh, taxonomy into a tree is that the first reason is it, it is basically a tree, but um, there are um, very few extra edges that um, makes it uh, not, not a tree for, for our algorithm. Because in our algorithm, the the ancestors need to be a needs to be a root path which contains um, only um, past past edges. I mean past edges. Uh, so we, we need to prune prune a tree to perform our model. And the second reason is that it is for the convenience of of evaluation because if a node have multiple parents, it is it would be hard to to evaluate our model since there are multiple ground truth nodes. And the third one is that our mm, compared baselines use this model, use these methods to prune the taxonomies into a tree. So this is for a fair comparison with them. But in the taxonomy completion task, the baseline doesn't need to prune the taxonomy into a tree. So this is not a required step for the overall taxonomy related models. Okay, and in those situations, like in the previous scenario where you need to uh, prune, I uh, was wondering if you can kind of provide a, some small amount of information on how the method works and what are like nodes that are going to be pruned and what are the information that are going to be lost in the process of the pruning? Uh, the pruning is generally um, taking a spanning tree of the taxonomy. And since the graph is connected, taking its spanning tree doesn't make the, uh, the, 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 the graph become disconnected. And um, it's just removing ex extra edges, you know. Sometimes there are two two steps from one node to another, and there are a one step edge that shortcuts the the the, the connection. So we just remove the the shortcut edge. I see. Okay. So this is just one of the scenarios, or is it like all the cases is just removing the shortcuts? Mm. Do we have other scenarios that you do you prune edges? Or is it just the shortcuts that you remove? Mostly it is shortcut because our our algorithm to prune the tree is removing the shortcuts to to save the long, longer longer connecting edges that ensures the node have mm, highest possible levels. And it of course with our baselines that we compare. I see I understand now. Thank you very much. Your Thank you. Uh, do we have other questions from the audience? OK, 
Okay. So seems there are no more questions. Thank you very much again, Sushan, for your very exciting presentation. Thank you, Dr. Berger, for asking questions. And thank you. Uh, thanks again for answering. We're moving on to the next talk, which is going to be by Thomas Martin, who is a PhD student at UCAM, and is going to uh, present the, uh, his presentation title is going to be Leveraging a Domain Ontology in a Neural Learning from Heterogeneous Data. So, uh, Thomas, uh, Hi. The floor is Hi, yours. Hi, everyone. Yes, I'm here. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, fine. Um, I'll share my screen. Mm, so, this, uh, this one, and this. Perfect. You should see the actual yep. presentation and not the uh, presenter screen. Yeah, right. Okay. I'm going to start. Um, so, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Thomas, a PhD student at, at CAM. Um, so, I'm going to present you our paper. Uh, leveraging a domain ontology in neural learning from heterogeneous data. Uh, this is a work we've done uh, in collaboration with the UCAMS Bioinformatics Lab and also a, a digital partner that's called Lactanet, which is a consulting company for, for uh, producers for um, dairy cows. Um, so the whole project revolves around uh, dairy cows and optimizing uh, production. Um, so we are going to talk about uh, domain ontologies and a little bit of uh, neural learning, so graphs, and, and then um, graphs, pattern mining, and the yeah, ontologies. Uh, the the main uh, idea is that uh, we want to learn uh, we want to learn the neural models on really complex domains, so like uh, life sciences, um, and usually that requires. Uh, large amounts of high quality data to be available, but most of the time we don't have them. But we have access to people, like experts, uh, which have a lot of expert knowledge, and they can complement all the available data and help us uh, build better models. So our main uh, idea is that we want to do, um, we want to mine what we call generalized graph patterns on top of a domain ontology. So I'm going to explain what a domain ontology is later on and then uh, generalize graph patterns. Uh, what you have to keep in mind for now is that those graph patterns, they are going to act as additional features uh, from for our models. So, so the idea is to use the experts to build new features on top of the data and then use those features through patterns to create better models. Uh, so you can see on the bottom left, a picture of uh, an ontology and the associated graph data. I know this is a little bit abstract for now, but it'll make sense in a, in a few slides. Um, so we're going to mine that graph to extract redundancies um, and uh, as, as patterns or fragments that are going to look uh, somehow like this, uh, you see in the middle, and we're going to feed those features to some neural net. Um, so you have two main uh, challenges. It's like, how are we going to mine those patterns? First, how can we define them and then mine them? And then later on, how can we feed uh, that data to a, a neural learner? Um, so the, the structure of the presentation uh, is going to be, we, I'm going to present the project. So the dairy domain, uh, the objectives, the data, the key challenges we faced when uh, trying to build uh, neural uh, models. Then I'm going to present really quickly what ontologies and knowledge graphs are. Um, I'm going to do a quick state of the art, present the vision from uh, for for the uh, graph patterns supported by ontologies, and then all the approach with the key challenges, the benefits, and then I'll add a couple of slides uh, to present the next steps of our work. Uh, and this is will be more like a, like a free form discussion where I can present ideas and you can challenge them. If you if you will. Um, so first, uh, as I said, the goal of the project is to optimize the dairy process by helping uh, producers to make better, uh, take more informed decisions for their herds and their cows. Um, so mainly that revolves around predicting how the how the future lactations for the cows will unfold um, because the uh, lactations, um, they 
determine the, the production of milk, as you all know. Um, and what we do is that we want to train models to do some kind of regression or classification of the yield or the cost or the profits. It's uh, it's all about helping the producer make better decisions. As you can see on the right, um, every decision has an impact on time and impact on profit. So you have to be able to uh, handle all those uh, factors and especially explain the, the decisions. Um, we have a lot of historical data. Uh, I think it goes up to maybe 10 or 15 years uh, of production data for cows in, in Canada. Uh, so that's a lot of cows, lots of herds, lots of, lots of time, so lots, of, lots of data. Uh, and we uh, are, through mining and other uh, machine learning techniques, we are um, assessing the impact of all the different factors. So what are all those factors? So in, in the data we have um, the three main uh, say boxes, uh, data that um, describes animals like cows and bulls and and um, like uh, their genetics, their pedigree, uh, their temperament or health events. Um, also things about more the environment in which they, they evolve, uh, like the herds as groups, what they eat, uh, climate, uh, their regions, and also a lot of production data, um, most what we call uh, milk control, which is uh, tests that are performed um, on the on milk samples like every month to test if everything is, is uh, goes uh, as planned. And uh, we also can use uh, market trends and prices. A few definitions to put everybody on the, on the same page. Uh, as I said, the lactation for a cow is just the production period, that it's cyclic, that it uh, happens. So you have like sequences of lactations uh, for, for cows. Um, uh, quality control, so it's an evaluation of the milk composition of some samples, and it gives us information about uh, mainly the health of, of the cow. And then we have another process called culling, which is when a producer decides or is forced to uh, remove a cow from a her. It could be to, to sell it or it could be like uh, she has a disease and is supposed to uh, treat her to make her feel better. Okay, so now we start the, the actual technical uh, part. Um, you can see uh, this is what it is is uh, a, a graph of a lot of things connected together through a graph representation with vertices and edges, which all have labels to describe um, what the, the contents of the graph. Um, so what that means is th this specific graph means that uh, in our database of cows, um, some cows, like 138, they are called by the producer for involuntary reasons, so independent of the will of the of the producer and those they have a couple of lactations that went somewhat uh, well up till the first um, the first quality control and then the second one uh, the the value of what uh, the, the some health indicator is uh, triggers some some warning um, so that might not seem to you like a really interesting feature to mind but from a domain perspective this means that we know that uh, in some cases, a producer, he was forced to remove the most of that, uh, chronic health issues. And this is really interesting to build uh, predictive models and even predictive ones, uh, because you can see that gives um, structured probable causes um, as uh, features for all that kind of come that makes um, 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 sorry, group Thomas, membership uh, decision process and maybe may even some. Um, um, Thomas, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you you keep uh, like I think there is a problem with your connection. You keep uh, keep losing you here and there. So uh, would you like to maybe double check your internet or if? Yes, uh, give me a couple of minutes. I'll yeah, sure, no check. problem. We're already ahead of a schedule, so you can. Okay. Uh, okay, so I'll let you look at the, at the pattern while I fix 
if you want to leave and it's come back, it's completely fine. Yeah, I think it's going to disconnect automatically, maybe. OK, sure. Thank you. Uh, uh, no worries. We have about five minutes. You can take five minutes. That's fine. OK, again, I, I'm sorry for the technical. Uh, uh, no problem. No, no worries. Mm -hmm. uh, things happen quite often, especially with the uh, online settings. So apologies everyone for the technical issue. Uh, we'll be right back when Tomo joins again. Uh, hopefully this time with a better internet connection so that we can better enjoy his talk. Hello again. Hello again and welcome back. So yes, I'm gonna say something and tell me if it's if it cuts, if it's fine. Is it better uh, than it was before? Yeah, it's at at this point it looks much better. And hopefully it will be okay. during the presentation too. So okay. Uh, can you tell me at what point uh, did you start uh, losing what I was saying or which it was slide pretty slide. much like this. The you can maybe start from the slide that you mentioned that you're going to start talking more technical stuff. Okay. Okay. Mm. Sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, okay. So now you see the slide. You hear me? Yep. I can. Yes. The slides we can yet see. We can see it now. Perfect. Okay. Okay. So if there are any issue, tell me. Um, I'll try to to fix it. Um, so uh, that was the slide where I was presenting uh, the kind of graph patterns we uh, are extracting from the data. Um, uh, so this this, as you can see on the on the, on the image is a graph representation of some complex phenomenon that occurs several times in the data. Um, what that means is that here, so you can see here we have uh, nodes, vertices, and edges that all have labels. You can recognize uh, the cows, the lactations, the quality controls, uh, the herd membership, and a few other terms I just uh, presented before, um, and uh, the interpretation of this pattern is that in uh, 138 um, cows in our database, um, the, the producer, he was forced to remove a cow and the most probable cause of that, that uh, is the, that seems to be chronic health issues um, on, on the cow. Uh, and, and so, Maybe that's not really interesting to, to, to do you. That doesn't seem like a really interesting uh, feature to know about. But for uh, domain experts, uh, that, that's really something they are interested to, to know to help uh, producers make better decisions. So um, to extract all those um, features and use them into our neural models, uh, that should be something um, uh, re really, really useful and, and interesting. Um, oh, 
Okay. Uh, so now uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the, the the challenges and the of of the whole uh, approach. Mm -hmm. So members of our team have tried to uh, build some deep neural models to uh, accurately predict meal yield, cost, profits, and several other uh, features. Um, the, the, the main challenge seems to be that uh, we have um, the, the data is too heterogeneous. You have temporal data, everything that's related to test and quality control that happens like every month. You have the lactation periods like I showed you on, on the right. You have the different parts and you can actually um, create uh, models that are like, uh, let's say, uh, curves for uh, the, all, the, all the yields, like the, the milk, the, the fat, the protein, and everything. Uh, everything is cyclic, but it's not uh, similar to every cow. You can also have diseases, uh, issues, and pharma decisions. You have a lot of static data, especially genetics, uh, genetic indices, uh, temperaments of a cow. And then you have um, relational data, like uh, membership to herds and groups and management groups, and also uh, the pedigree could be seen as some kind of relational data. Um, so th there was a paper published by the team that shows that the uh, so far uh, RNNs, recurrent neural nets, they fail to catch the dynamics of the cow life cycle. They are able to predict accurately many, many things, but um, especially when a cow is dry, they have trouble to understand that uh, the cow is not producing anything and she actually still needs to be fed, so it costs uh, uh, that that those are some hidden costs for the for the producer. Um, now the question is, uh, we can describe all this, and the main experts they can talk about all those phenomena and help us uh, write that down. The question is, how can we use all, all that knowledge uh, and model that structure that into a domain ontology to guide the neural net create better models? Um, and we can do that by uh, reflecting all the existing practices and all the relevant technical domain, the knowledge of the of, of the dairy domain. Um, but even with even knowing that uh, neural nets and like ontologies and graphs and pattern mining, they are really two kind of different uh, approaches. They have different expression levels. One is what we know as a symbolic, we use symbols to represent and describe everything. But the other one is what we call sub-symbolic. Uh, it works as a more low level, uh, more closer to some kind of signal uh, information propagation level, which makes uh, symbolic information uh, really uh, difficult to distill in that, uh, uh, at that expression level. Mm. And on top of that, we also need to uh, have um, let's say, explainable and interpretable uh, results and models because at the end of the day, we want uh, people to um, consult and help the producers make better decisions so everybody needs to understand what, what they are doing and what are the kind of decisions they are, they are, they are making. Uh, so now I'm going to present uh, what are graphs, uh, knowledge graphs, ontologies, uh, data graphs, um, in a really, really quick way. Uh, so a graph representation is uh, built around vertices that are connected by edges. So you can have here a lot of uh, vertices that describe uh, things and that I, I think most of you know, uh, like Eiffel Tower or Da Vinci or like uh, the idea of a country. Um, and um, we we can structure them with uh, links for connections. Uh, I didn't write the, the labels of the properties, but you can imagine that, uh, for example, you have Alice bottom left and Bob, so it could be the link could be they know each other and they are both uh, persons. Uh, like France is a country, uh, and uh, like uh, Eiffel Tower is located in Paris, for example. Uh, so all of this, uh, you can divide that into several uh, levels or layers. Um, the first one, the most easier to understand, is what we call the data level, the actual things that you're going to have in your database. So you can see that Alice, Bob, uh, Da Vinci, uh, the Louvre, uh, Paris, France, and like Eiffel Tower, they are uh, things that you can uh, point to, let's say, and you can uh, structure them into some kind of some kind of database. 
then you have other um, other uh, let's say entities like uh, Da Vinci, Molise, Louvre, uh, Paris, uh, France, and Eiffel Tower. They also are um, things that could be on the data level, but they are uh, let's say like references entities that that everybody knows about. Um, so that's more like the knowledge graph level, and on top of that, you also have things that represent more abstract ideas like places, uh, museums, like person, a country, city. Uh, so those are the kind of entities we define on the ontology level. And we also define all the possible relationships uh, in, the, in the ontology level. So as you can see, now we're going to have uh, things defined in uh, the ontology level, abstract ideas that uh, then will be used by uh, things on the data level, concrete things in the data level. This is like similar to what we can do with like uh, object-oriented programming. We have like class models and you have instance objects. Um, so it's it's really similar to to what we do in, in programming. Uh, so from those three layers, um, you can also have uh, additional relationships on inside the ontology level that can describe relationships uh, between classes and properties. Like this similar that what we had in the previous presentation with like taxonomies, like trees of hierarchies that can help better describe uh, things. Um, so now if we focus on the ontology level and the data level, uh, we can use the ontology level as some kind of schema that's going to be used by the data level through instantiation. Uh, so you can have nodes and links in the data level, like France is located in Paris, that are both instances of uh, respectively country for France and the concept, the class Paris for the city. Uh, I hope all this makes sense. Um, and so what we're going to do uh, in forward is we um, are going to exploit redundancies in the data level that we're going to, let's say, map or project into the ontology level to uh, reflect um, more interesting um, and better defined uh, redundancies and uh, fragments in what we call patterns. Um, so if I make a few changes to make that fit uh, the, the domain and the, and the project, um, we have here we have classes like herd, cows, lactation, and test. And in the data level, you're gonna have like specific herds, specific cows, lactation, etc., all linked between between them. Uh, in reality, it's a lot more complex. We have like a fully blown uh, owl ontology, which has a lot more, a lot more than this, and that will be the object of other uh, publications. And it will be public at, at some point, the ontology itself. Uh, really quickly, um, really quickly. Uh, so we, we've we developed the domain ontologies held by the experts, and we also had to convert a lot of raw uh, data to, to make it uh, fit the schema, uh, schema, sorry, the graph representation that we had then to split into uh, several graphs for each cow to be able to, to mine patterns that appear across each graph. Um, Mm. Okay, so now uh, recall what I said on the three layers, the knowledge graph layer, the uh, data layer, and the uh, ontology layer. Uh, and those uh, three, um, let's say, levels, they are used to uh, do three kinds of possible uh, uses of all that uh, domain knowledge. Um, the, the most I think the most known one is RDF to VEC, which is word to VEC, but like applied to, uh, let's say, uh, the data level using using the ontology information um, to do some kind of entity embedding. Um, more recently, you have what it's known as knowledge infused learning, which you use uh, actually the knowledge graph part, the blue layer, to uh, help your neural nets to learn. Um, uh, through different parts of the using different parts of that of that of that graph, and that uh, goes uh, through the use of dedicated like loss functions and updates to the backpropagation mechanism. Uh, the most interesting one is now how can we feed um, only only the the ontology information, the definition of the of the domain to the to the neural net. Uh, as far as we know, there are two uh, approaches. Like the, the first one, it tries to build uh, embedding for the classes from bottom up uh, by using the embeddings of different properties. Uh, 
Um, and the other one is to, to like try to mimic the structure of the abstraction of the ontologies by adding uh, layers in the neural net, um, a layer per uh, abstraction level in the uh, domain ontology. So I really welcome you to read the, the full paper or even each one of the papers we have in the reference to understand how all this works. Um, for the context of the presentation, uh, it's what's important is that there are not many approaches that actually um, try to only rely on the domain ontology to help the, 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 the neural net um, understand better the, the domain. So what uh, we uh, are achieving now is that uh, injection of knowledge from the ontology into the neural learning process. So as I presented at the beginning, I presented you one feature, one graph feature uh, built with uh, ontology parts. We want to uh, use that kind of features to augment uh, the available data. Um, learn. That want to mine uh, ontology generalized graph patterns. That means there are graph patterns that are built only with uh, parts of the ontology. Um, so the goal is to express uh, all the conceptual structure described in the ontology that is shared between data records, uh, but not explicit uh, in the data. You can have different, uh, maybe literal or instance classes that seem different, but on the conceptual level, they actually re represent the same idea, the same, uh, the same trend. So it's it's interesting and uh, interesting and useful to to mine all those uh, redundancies, and also uh, preserving all the relationships between the the, the concepts and the classes uh, will preserve the the context in which the uh, phenomenon appeared in, in, in the data. Um, I'm gonna go really quickly on this one. It's it's the, it's just to explain what uh, patterns actually are. The idea of patterns is to mine recurring data fragments. Um, it could be on uh, transactions or sequences. Uh, you see that as uh, you could see like a, like baskets in online. Uh, in online shopping, like a transaction is one basket, uh, a sequence of baskets, like a user history is what we call a sequence. So you can also extract um, uh, hidden structures uh, in, in that kind of structures. And then the most interesting one is the uh, graph structure in which everything is connected by vertices and edges. And you can uh, you can extract really complex uh, substructures in, in all this. Um, it's uh, really challenging um, effort because most of the challenges they they revolve around two two uh, two two things. Uh, the first is the pattern to data matching. Um, so you can you can generate uh, a pattern, but then you have to count how many times it appears in in, in the data. And with graph patterns, uh, that means basically a subgraphismorphism that you have to perform on every data graph that can really become uh, expensive and challenging. And the other one is um, what we call uh, reducing the duplicates. It means that um, you can easily be overwhelmed by um, trying to explore the set of all possible graphs and uh, making the mistake of mm, generating the same one several times. Uh, simply put, if you try to, uh, let's say, give some kind of order uh, in which you have to build a graph on the, on the right, uh, you can clearly quickly see that you can build that graph several, several ways, a lot of different ways. And if you wanted to uh, generate all, all the graph, all the possible subgraphs, and try to add, let's say, a new completed with vertices or edges, you could have many ways to obtain the same the same structure. So that's another one of the of the of the challenges. Mm. Again, this is the um, state of the art on uh, pattern mining with ontologies. Um, here, uh, so several approaches have already been trying to uh, extract patterns from. Uh, uh, graph data and supported by ontologies, uh, you can see uh, most of it, they actually lose either the graph structure or the all the taxonomy or hierarchical information. So um, none of them are actually satisfactory. 
um, and uh, some uh, some existing approaches they actually use both the uh, graph information and the hierarchical information, but they do that by following some kind of sequential backbone, uh, which uh, constrains the, the exploration, so you don't really have uh, uh, generic graphs, sequences with uh, triples and, uh, and relationships. So here, the, the general problem of mining such RDF graphs um, yeah, has not been studied, as you understand. Um, so we could define it like this. Uh, we could have as input the set of all the RDF graphs that are directed graphs, that are potentially multigraphs. That means that you can have between the two same nodes, you could have several relationships, um, and they are uh, labeled on both vertices and edges. Uh, we could use the domain ontology as a learning parameter uh, to guide the to guide the learning and the generation of all the all the possible patterns. And as output, we would have only the most relevant uh, graph graph patterns that are also directed in potentially multi graphs. But this time, on the output, the the labels for the classes and the vertices they would be only uh, domain ontology classes and properties defined by the experts. So that helps because um, they use the, the vocabulary that everybody has agreed upon and is correctly defined. So that's going to be for better uh, results and more explainable ones. Um, so a quick a quick example to explain uh, what is the common conceptual structure invisible in the raw data. So picture two graphs, as you can see on, on the on the bottom. Uh, that represent cows, uh, some ancestors, uh, lactations, and a few diseases they had and they were treated for. Um, so every node here uh, is on the data level and on the bottom right of each node, you can see the class on the ontology level. For example, when if you look at Molly, the cow, it's an instance of the class young cow. And you have this for every, um, every uh, node. In the, in the in those examples. Uh, so from those two graphs, we could extract that this graph here on the right is a, a pattern shared by both. Um, so you see that bull and young cow are in every graph and they are all three treated with uh, specific kinds of antibiotics like glucosamide and beta lactans. Um, so on the left, you have the data, and on the right, you have the graph pattern with the kind of uh, abstraction level we are interested in. So those graph patterns on the right, they're going to be used as features, as I said, that refer only to the domain ontologies and conceptual structure. They're going to help a bit better better models. Uh, they are challenge, quite challenging to, to extract, but as you can see on the example, they're going to provide a valuable context um, to the to the shared elements in, in the data, so on the left. Uh, so, so as I said, um, graph mining, uh, RDF graph mining, or domain ontology supported graph mining, uh, is a really uh, complex problem uh, because we inherit from the all the complexity of the classical uh, frequent graph pattern mining, um, and we also need to exploit all the levels on the ontology at the same time, uh, meaning that we could have uh, in the patterns, we could have things like, like cow or bull, but we could also have like bovine, for example, if we have uh, redundancies that are shared by both wolves and bovines. And this is true for the classes, but this is also true for all the properties we could possibly define on, on any uh, abstract level. And once we have all the frequent uh, graph patterns, then we need to uh, do some kind of filtering because, as with many, as all approaches of pattern mining, frequent pattern mining, the, the output is usually too uh, consequent to be uh, manually analyzed. So you need to implement some uh, filtering measure to reduce and compact all the output pattern set. Um, so this is the 
pipeline uh, we put in production for the uh, project I spoke about. Uh, mostly nothing new here, uh, except that you can see that from the data graphs we mine the patterns and then we feed those patterns to the neural learner and we build some kind of predictive model from, from this. And the, the whole point was to somehow bridge the gap between all the domain experts that we can encode in the ontology and all the recurrent substructures that exist in the data we have. We have to somehow match them both to create better features and hence better patterns. Um, I'm going to pass this one, I think, quick. Um, this summarizes the, the, whole, the whole approach. Uh, through using domain ontology-based patterns, we want to increase the abstraction level of the summarization of the information in the data that is beyond the uh, what's actually present in the data, in the instance level, the data layer I presented in the beginning. Uh, and through that, we want to increase the generalization power of the combined um, architecture of the domain ontology and the neural learning. So, then we are going to rely on the learning capabilities of the neural net to combine all the patterns uh, into maybe higher order patterns similar to what's been done with convolution uh, on pictures, for example, uh, when you can see parts of the picture that represent some kind of humanly understandable uh, concept uh, to, to, to emerge. Um, and so we bet that um, all the predictions will be enhanced with the all that semantic information. And even if it's not, uh, all the results should be a lot more explainable through the use of the patterns and the ontology components. So I still have two slides. Uh, now I'm going to present you the what's next. Uh, and this is more like going to be more some kind of discussion. So you feel like you have questions or you want to complete uh, something or want to ask more about uh, some specific thing, uh, feel, free to, feel free to ask. So with all the patterns, uh, we want to build some, uh, as I said, better representations uh, for the data, uh, you like like embeddings, so lower dimensional and continuous vector spaces, uh, and we could think of two uh, different approaches to to actually do that. Um, the first one is to use um, to to actually mine uh, the patterns from the data we have, as you can see on the right, and use them as additional descriptors of the original ones we have, so the original columns and features of, of the data set. Um, so without those patterns, what we could do is to uh, build some kind of uh, embedding uh, using only the uh, raw data records uh, we have. Um, but we want to go beyond that and use both like the uh, original data and the each pattern as a new feature, a new, let's say, a new column uh, in the data. And uh, it could be like a, a binary uh, binary column or some kind of percentage matching of the actual, if the cow matches the, the pattern. Uh, and to build um, probably a more interesting and better structured uh, uh, vector spaces and uh, what's going to be interesting here is to actually measure, measure the improvements of the uses of the embedding with the patterns uh, against the uh, without the, the patterns and we could even do some kind of feature ranking to try to um, measure which feature is the most important one uh, and especially to distinguish between uh, the, the pattern ones and the original column ones. Uh, now, the, the, the actual interrogation is how is the ontological conceptual structure uh, going to be reflected in the uh, produced embedding? Are we going to see, are we going to be able to, let's say, uh, have some kind of translation operation that can, uh, let's say, help navigate between abstraction levels? Uh, this is like an open question. So if any of you have uh, additional insight on this or questions, you'd be welcome to, to, to discuss that. Um, 
And now I'm going to present the, the other uh, the other idea. Uh, so now we still mine all the all the patterns in, in the data, but the difference is instead of using uh, both original data and and um, graph patterns, we are going to take only the graph representation of the data, which here you can see on the on the example where C is for cows, L is for lactations, T is for test for quality control. Um, and we actually are going to uh, decorate the, those graphs with the patterns that match um, each one of them. And we are going to uh, link them with some kind of um, relationship that represents um, the link between, as I presented in the beginning, uh, the ontology layer and the data layer. Um, and then subsequently, we will use those augmented or decorated graph patterns and embed them, create feature vectors, uh, trying to preserve as much of the graph uh, information as we can in the ontology versus uh, data level, and um, then uh, use that to build uh, feature vectors and build uh, then another kind, a richer kind, a better kind of embeddings uh, as we, we, we think uh, would happen. Um, so that's all I had to present to you. Um, I hope you have questions or interrogations or things you'd like to discuss. Uh, so uh, thanks for listening and I will answer your questions. Thank you very much, Toma, for your very interesting presentation. We have about five minutes for the questions from the audience. So once again, you can use the raise hand option to uh, mention that you have questions. You can see that Tima Bagusi, if I pronounce the name correctly, has a question. Yes, hi. Um, I didn't quite catch how do you guide the neural network layer with the generalized ontological graph patterns. Can you just quickly review that? Yes. Um, yes, uh, I'm going to share my screen again. Uh, OK, um, this one, right. So uh, the graph patterns, they represent um, recurring phenomena in the data uh, that are hidden, but we can um, actually represent uh, through using the ontology layer. They, they are redundancies that do not um, uh, occur several times on the data layer, but they do on the ontology layer. Uh, so if you if you get that, then we use uh, those patterns uh, as additional just features um, to, um, let's say, add new columns into our data set to say, like, like uh, really, you know, really plainly, um, so the data set is, let's say, each row is, represents a cow, all the, 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 the information about a cow, and if a cow uh, matches with a specific pattern, then we could put some kind of binary information like yes, no, or some kind of percentage um, into the data, and then we feed all those, uh, all those um, features into the neural net, and then we let the neural net uh, manipulate the features as it usually does, um, to create uh, better uh, representations. Um, and then we could have another uh, approach where we can uh, embed everything as graphs in, in input, uh, but then, then the guiding is going to be less clear because they do the patterns do not really appear as features, they appear as components, something like that, so that, that's less clear. Um, but I really don't know if your question was more about what's the role of the patterns for the learning or more about what happens inside the network when we learn? Uh, how, so my question was more about how do you feed it and how do you guide it? So you said that the patterns guide the learning. And so, so yeah. these binary, binary um, labels, what do they mean? So the binary label here could mean that uh, if you take uh, um, a row in the data set that represents a cow, 
uh, if you have like uh, the, the binary column at one, it means that that cow matches with the pattern, meaning that that cow has, for example, if the pattern says the cow, uh, the pattern I showed in the in, in the really beginning um, that I'm going to just show now. So if a cow matches with this pattern, that means that uh, the cow in the data has at least two lactations. It was removed by the producer for some uh, involuntary reason and we have then information about the quality test. So those are the kind of features that we think that today the neural net is not able to catch from the raw data. So by structuring those so those patterns in a explicit graph um, with an explicit graph representation, we uh, and, and then um, just giving uh, adding a, additional information on the data that describes if the cow matches or doesn't match the pattern, um, we believe that the neural net is going to favor us and going to tend to uh, use more of the variable digesting in some, uh, let's say, edge cases. Uh, now, the, the important part is that this pattern alone is maybe not that useful for the learning. Uh, it's it's going to become useful when we can have lots, lots and lots of different patterns like this one that represent, um, let's say, hidden uh, uh, phenomena that the neural net cannot really see on the data level. It has to rely on the ontological conceptual structure to to see the redundancy. Uh, so far, this is really experimental. So it, this is this is like really, 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 really. really um, the, the next steps of the work so far we are really focused on extracting the, the patterns uh, so we have good results uh, so the next step are going to be really, really critical to to test all those uh, hypotheses i understand so basically the pattern the ontological pattern itself is not encoded in any way in the neural net only if a um, yes. node matches a feature or not right Yes, exactly. So okay. I said binary, but it could be something a bit more uh, like percentages or I yeah. don't know, something mm -hmm. big. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. We are unfortunately out of the question period. So once again, thank you, Thomas, for your very exciting presentation. Um, moving forward to the last talk by Torsten Sherlock, who is a, uh, an applied research scientist from ServiceNow and is going to present text to SQL translation be it do or rat. So without further ado, uh, Torsten, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, should I keep the camera on or deactivate it? Um, both fine. It's both fine. OK. I believe that once you present your slides, your camera is going to be small down below. Right. So that should be the case right now. Can you confirm the slides are up? Yep. It's Perfect, thank you. Wonderful. OK, cool, then I'll start. Hi, my name is Torsten, uh, and I'm going to present one of the projects I've been working on at ServiceNow. Uh, but first, I would like to thank Guillaume and Hassan for the invitation and for giving me the opportunity to share with you the results of my recent work. Um, mm -hmm. Next slide, how does this work here? Sorry, I'm not a frequent PowerPoint user. <laughs> Um, and second, um, I'd like to take a moment to talk about my team. Uh, we are a group of researchers uh, at ServiceNow interested uh, in human-machine interaction through language. And that means that our mission is to advance uh, AI technology and to enable the next generation of language user interfaces. Um, we're integrated into the research group at Element AI, which is now a ServiceNow company that has been acquired. Uh, and we collaborate with researchers both inside the company and outside. So for instance, we have very strong ties with both McGill and also Mila, and we are linked to Stanford through Christopher Manning and most recently Monica Lamb. So um, I talked about language user interfaces, so let me introduce you how we see language interfaces. So imagine a box in an app or a website like the one shown here, right? You've seen this before. There is a text field where a user can type anything she wants, 
So there's no drop down menu, no item list, no bullet points, no restrictions, just free text. So we can really type whatever. And suppose now the user types, for example, uh, what are my meetings today? And clicks the ask button. So if the system that's underlying this uh, understands the user's requests, and if it has access to the request information, then it may respond by showing an overview of the user's calendar for say, um, or uh, for the current day, or it may return a natural language response that summarizes the user's schedule, right? So like maybe every gra a graphical response or a textual response. Um, and this is not really what I want to talk about. I want to talk about something else, which is how may the system go about answering the request? Well, it has to consider the context. That is the user's input uttering. So what's been typed here? What are my meetings today? But also the environment in which it is stated. So that means it needs to know about the domain of meetings and calendars. It needs to know who the user is because she refers to herself not by name, but with the word my. And it needs to know also the current date because it says today. Um, so that means this question is contextual, right? And then also uh, the system needs to know how to compile all this information, all this context into an execution plan that can be run against some calendar backend service to produce the answer. And it is this process that I want to focus on today, how to go from context to execution plan. And I will focus on the case in which the execution plan is expressed in SQL code and where we use a neural model to generate that code. So from a high vantage point, the view is somehow like this. So there's a lot of stuff on this slide. I will go through it slowly. Uh, on the left hand side, we have the inputs, right? So these, this Venn diagram there, um, and we refer to this as the context. Uh, that is all the information that may be considered by the system. There's linguistic context, the, the upper bubble, like the user's utterance, for instance, but also structural context, the lower bubble like the schema or domain we are building a language user interface for. So in the example before, this was calendars. Uh, typically, uh, the more context that can be provided, the better for addressing the user's request. And towards the right in this diagram, we meet the machine learning model that assisted by symbolic reasoning, so that's that box below, and based on as much context as possible, produces an output program or an utterance. Uh, and here we assume that the output is symbolic, therefore symbolic reasoning, and in particular, executable SQL code. So you want to run what's come out of the system on a database, right? So we also have a lot of constraints in the output that come in through the structural context, right? So like, because we're dealing with SQL, and SQL is a formal language that has syntax and semantics, all of this needs to be taken into account by the system, right? So you want to produce output that can actually be run on a database, and it's not like uh, invalid. So to assure this, this is the job uh, of the symbolic reasoning component, right? And it somewhat interacts with the model and the model that acts with it to come to a better um, outcome. So let's now zoom more closely into this text to SQL task that I'm supposed to talk about here. Um, we want a model, a neural model that can answer users question about data in a database, right? So this is sort of like an enabling tool um, that users can use that who are themselves not experts, right? They don't know SQL themselves necessarily, but they just want to talk about uh, data. They want to ask factual questions and um, the system should pick them up, understand them and uh, co convert them into, into code, right? Um, so this lowers the, the barrier of entry for these systems. And if this has any chance of working, then our model doesn't have to learn all the contents of the database, it only needs to learn how to talk to the database server that then can answer the user's questions on the model's behalf, right? So that means it's only, or it's enough to learn how to translate natural language to SQL, right? In goes natural language, the, the question, out comes SQL code. Um, and if you only wanna have to do this on one database with one schema, um, then this can be trained like a translation model, right? From English to say French. So in goes English, out comes French, here instead of French with SQL. So in, for this, you, you would need to line up enough pairs of questions in SQL code so that you can train the model uh, until you have the performance you want. 
Uh, however, that could require a large number of pairs of uh, natural language in C4. And like generating such a corpus, right, is costly, right? Because you need experts who understand C4 and can write it in order to get high quality labels. Um, and if you have more than one database, right, then you want to encourage the model to learn in a way that generalizes all the database schemas. Why? Because that way you will need much less training data per database and the results will be more robust. You can bring your model to production more quickly to, for every new database uh, you want to support. Right? So like you go from one to many databases um, and each additional database will be less work because you need less and less training examples per database because you hope that, that learnings from all these already trained uh, database um, examples will transfer to the unseen database. And this is a big promise, right? So they can actually do that. In order to track progress on this promise, uh, we will, in this study, only evaluate on unseen databases, right? So like you have a training corpus that has um, a bunch of databases and corresponding questions and SQL code for them, but we will only evaluate on databases that the model has not seen at training time, right? So they're completely unfamiliar. So in other words, the databases in the training that will be different from the databases the model will have to work on once it is trained. And for this to work, uh, the model must encode the database schema as well, because so that it can recognize when a user refers to specific columns or tables, right? So like the database schema, sort of the encoding of the of the domain, and the tables typically tend to be corresponding to uh, question subjects, right? So in this case, here these cases. And uh, the columns are sort of like the, the meta information about these subjects. Um, and then you also have glue tables, right? So like if you have like a one to many or a many, many to many uh, relationship between different subjects, then you would have to also uh, tables that are connected to other tables with foreign key relationships. So you sort of have this ontological graph, right? Uh, and you can see an example on the left. Um, so the user talks about cases. What are the cases opened by Disney in January 2021? So these are like support incidences. And the model needs to figure out that this is a reference to the cases table in the database, right? Um, and of course, here it's more or less easy because uh, the user already uses the word cases, but most likely the user will maybe not use exactly the word cases, maybe incidences, right? Or faults or problems or errors, I don't know what. So um, actually, this needs to work on a semantic level. So more generally speaking, the model needs to be able to reason about questions in the context of the schema, because the schema is what defines um, the domain that the question uh, is anchored to. Uh, there we go. So how can we build a model that does all that? Um, so our model is called DURAD. Um, and in order to answer this question, let's go back to the high level picture uh, we've seen before, but let's refine it now for the use case uh, of text to sql only. So on the one hand, we've got the user's natural language question and the names of the tables and columns. Uh, that's the linguistic context. So like this is referred to as user utterance and identifier names. So the identifier names are the table names and column names. And on the other hand, we have the structural context that's about the SQL schema, which encodes the, the domain. Um, and this includes also the columns types, right? So like we have uh, numerical types, we have string types, um, and you can take this into account as well. Uh, both of these kinds of information are encoded by our Durad text SQL model in a join fashion. That means like the model takes into account both. And um, the model is trained then on many different database schemas and afterwards evaluated on database schemas that it has never seen before, right? So this is the zero shot uh, paradigm or, or setting. Uh, and if this is going to work at all, our Durad model must learn how to reason about the question in the context of any given SQL schema and vice versa, right? The good news is that there are a lot of linguistic and structural learnings from the text to SQL task that transfer between databases. And the model only has to figure out how to apply its knowledge in the context of a new schema. Uh, and in order to help it, uh, we can impose some constraints. So you've maybe seen that like this, this uh, reasoning engine has now been replaced by constraint decoding. So this is just one uh, instantiation of this paradigm. 
So for instance, we can force the model to only refer to columns and tables that exist in a database, right? So like if the model were to produce SQL code that refers to tables and databases that are not in a schema, then of course our database engine will reject immediately this, this query. So you want to prevent that. And beyond that, we can even force the model to always produce syntactically correct SQL, right? Because we know that SQL is a constrained language, right? It has a definition as a grammar for it. Uh, you can have infinitely many SQL expressions, right? Or different SQL expressions, but you, it's, a, it's a constrained space, right? Uh, and, and the way we do this, um, so like we uh, make it such that syntactically incorrect SQL is just unrepresentable. So in other words, by construction of how this is work, okay, our do-wrap model can make a syntax error, right? So like um, at least at the syntactic level, the SQL is valid, but there may be semantic problems that we cannot address with this method still, but it is, it is definitely better than not doing this. All right, so let's talk about um, the data set a bit. So um, how does actually our do-wrap model do? Uh, it works actually quite well. Um, so the research community for like text to SQL uh, research has focused mainly on a text to SQL data set called Spider. Uh, just Google for it, you can find it easily. Um, and you can see how Duorat performs there compared to uh, everyone else on the right. So um, I made a screenshot of this a while ago, so maybe we're not on place seven anymore, but uh, I think this was like two months ago that I took the screenshot. And there we're on place number seven. Um, and what is Spider? Uh, Spider is a large open uh, cross domain text to SQL data set. So that means, um, well, large is obvious. Open means, well, anybody can use it. There's, uh, uh, like you can even use it for commercial stuff. Um, and cross domain means that uh, there are many databases, hundreds actually, uh, 200 databases, uh, and, and they're spread over 138 different domains, right? So like uh, each domain maybe like, uh, is about different things. So calendars versus, let's say, movies versus Yelp uh, versus I don't know what, right? Um, publications and so on. Uh, and in total, we have uh, 10,000 questions uh, in, in this uh, data set and thousands of unique SQL queries um, with varying complexity, right? So like sometimes you have more than one uh, natural language phrasing for uh, a SQL query, right? And then you would have um, uh, two questions for one, one SQL query in the database for that. So that means also like uh, there are many more ways to express the intent of the user uh, in natural language, then there are ways to express it in SQL. And um, with regard to complexity, so like the, the, the complexity of these SQL queries ranges from very simple, where you just have like a simple select statement, select star from table or whatnot, or very complicated and nested, right? So you can encounter uh, queries where uh, you, so you have like a, a where condition that itself is another table, right? Um, or uh, self joins and, and like many, many joins at levels because you have these many, many to uh, many to many relationships that you need to take into account and so forth. Um, and our model performs competitively compared to the current state of the art or the state of the art two months ago, while being both simpler and faster. Um, we solved 70% of the tasks in Spider's death set successfully, right? So like that means that our model can given uh, can be given a question for an entirely unfamiliar SQL schema, and with a 70% chance, it will produce the correct SQL query. Uh, note that there are other models that do a bit better than Durat. However, these models rely on very involved task-specific pre-training curricula. So specifically, Grappa and GAP are of that sort. Um, and this is a high-stakes game we didn't yet want to play, so that this pre-training stuff, right? Because um, you have to assemble a lot of data, you have to clean that data, you have to train also on many, many uh, GPUs for a long time, right? And then you have to iterate on this. And then uh, since this is pre-training and you actually want to fine tune that thing then on, on the spider data set, do you have also then dependencies between the pre-training scheme and your downstream application of text to SQL? So this is extremely <laughs> involving and we thought we would want to make impact elsewhere and be concentrated on, on making a model that's simpler and faster and more uh, and also competitive with the current state of the art. And I think we achieved that. Um, so with this, let's now go and uh, try our Durat live, right? So I have a demo planned and I hope it actually works. Um, so let me know, first of all, if you can see now the, the Chrome section here, I think I should probably make this a bit larger. 
and also I hope that this thing still works because it started a little while ago. Um, so, so this is a little app we've built around um, our uh, uh, DURAD model. And on the left hand side, you can see we can select databases. So there are two databases um, that I've conf configured the system currently with. And there are also three models. So that means we can actually see um, the predictions that three different DURAD checkpoint models can come up with. And then in the middle or in the main part, uh, you can see the IMDB schema. So like we have an actor table and these are then the columns, right? There's like a unique ID uh, for each row. We have a gender name, nationality, birth city, birth year, uh, and so on, right? There's copyright information, cast, genre, classification. Uh, and this seems to be actually a many-to-many -many map uh, table. We see that uh, it's mostly ID field, so that, that uh, means it's some sort of like glue table. Uh, company information, director, producer, director by, keyword, made by, movie, and so on. Um, and so this is a large schema with several tables, and each table has several columns, right? Uh, and then this demo is built such that you have uh, a choice between uh, well, canned questions, like pre-selected or pre-made questions, and these are actually the, the development uh, questions uh, from the spider data set, right? So like. Uh, the model has not seen the IMDB data, uh, the IMDB schema, or any questions from there uh, during training. So it's basically trying, or it has to to function on this unseen schema here. And uh, these are the questions that come with the spider um, uh, data set. And and you can see I like, uh, have the ability to quickly just select one of them. Uh, and here's like uh, the question again, and then the ground truth SQL that goes with it. Um, and our model uh, comes up with these predictions, right? So this um, doesn't work exactly perfectly. Uh, it's also because this IMDB data set or the IMDB schema is a little bit different than the ones that uh, that are um, uh, 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 than the others that are uh, in in the in the spider data set um, for reasons I can go into uh, on requests. But basically, um, you can see that. Um, the models uh, do not necessarily always agree, right? So like, there's a bit of like statistical variation between uh, DFDs and checkpoints. Although all of these have basically this 70% development accuracy, they may not always agree with, with one another, right? So keep this in mind. So uh, let me just select another question here. Uh, find all actors born in Tehran. Um, yeah, still works, very good. <laughs> um, and you can see that uh, the parameters would have been exact name from actor or birthday is Tehran, uh, and not all models actually get this, right? Only the last one has this. The other ones are a bit uh, uncertain because this one is confused about the birth city versus name, nationality. I don't know what's going on here, but um, yeah, so that there, there's still some problems, but still on average, we will achieve 70%. Um, let me select another one. Uh, in what year was Benedict Cumberbatch born? Okay. Because I wanted to illustrate a problem that is uh, quite interesting and that that um, someone needs to address. So, um, right. So I don't see the, this here. One moment. Yeah. So this here, for instance. So I'm asked the question: What year was Benedict Cumberbatch born? Uh, and you can see that like two models think that we're talking about the actor Benedict Cumberbatch. And the third one thinks we're talking about the director Benedict Cumberbatch. And the reason for this is that um, this database schema is not completely normalized. And uh, Benedict Cumberbatch is prolific, right? He's not only an actor, he's also a director and maybe even a writer of, of scripts for movies. And that means this name appears in several places, right? And the question was just about Benedict Cumberbatch and not the actor Benedict Cumberbatch or the director Benedict Cumberbatch. And therefore, um, there's a chance that we just get the wrong Benedict Cumberbatch, although they all refer to the same Benedict Cumberbatch, but the way it's represented in the database, this is not immediately clear. So in order to make this um, more, uh, I lost my mouse pointer. Ah, there we go. Uh, in order to make this uh, more clear, I can refine the question. I can ask in what year was the actor, uh, Benedict uh, Cum sorry, Cumberbatch, uh, born. Oh, great. Sorry, there's some teasing problems here with this front end.
Okay, sorry about that. In what year was the actor Benedict Cumberbatch born? Right, and now all models agree that we're talking about the actor, right? And if I change this to director, director, now all the models think we're talking about the director Benedict Cumberbatch. So you can resolve this by being more uh, specific. So um, there's also another schema here, Yelp, which is about like yellow page entries. Uh, schema looks a bit different. And um, so we don't have actually a test um, or like any ability to 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 say um, yeah like this question doesn't make sense in this in this domain right so like you can see that the model actually tries to answer the question in what year was the director Benny become a bitch born and it tries to interpret this in the in the context of this new schema but of course this doesn't make sense right there's nothing to do with reviews of businesses but this is sort of like what the model thinks is the closest approximation of how we would answer this question in, in that domain, right? So like a better model, but this is actually not part of the spider data set, would actually say, eh, I can't answer this because this is out of scope, right? So I just wanted to show you this uh, this little quirk here. OK, so let's go back to the to the slide deck. And I'm not sure how I'm doing on time. It's 11.45 right now. So maybe I can talk to you quickly through the architecture of Durad, at least on like a high level. Um, so Dura encodes the input utterance jointly with the SQL schema. So um, in order to do so, it first finds mentions of tables, columns, and database values. So we're using the database content as well in the user's utterance and then produce a tag query. So this is the second um, thing here, like what are the, and then we have this tag here, TM tables, cases, cases, and then we close this tag open by uh, right, Disney and, and it finds Disney in the, in the uh, database as a value, and then it attacks uh, Disney with a value match, so VM central value match, in the table user column ID, right? Uh, in January uh, 2021, excuse me. Uh, and then all this information, like the, the, the query, the tags, the schema, and additional relational features are then fed to our Durat's encoder. Uh, and the encoder consists of BERT, so we use a BERT large here, uh, and additional transformer layers that return an encoding of both the question and the schema, right? So like both of these things are, are joined. And uh, the decoder then is another transformer that is connected to the encoder via cross attention. So this mimics sort of like the vanilla um, transformer architecture, except that we're stacking here different uh, kinds of transformers, right? Where BERT is more or less a vanilla transformer. We also use something called the relational aware transformer encoder, which is sensitive to graph information that we can feed it, which refers to relations. And, and this encodes, for instance, um, the, 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 the foreign key relations in the schema and which columns and which table and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, the decoder then uh, generates the SQL order aggressively, so like one token at a time. But these tokens are not like subword tokens, as you would use, let's say, for for like a bird model or a, a T5 model. Uh, these are special tokens, and they're uh, designed to be serialized uh, to the abstract uh, syntax tree of the SQL query, right? So like we have sort of sort of like a like an alphabet or vocabulary of of control tokens. And they represent a, this, uh, a serialization of a tree structure, which is the, the syntax tree uh, of the uh, SQL query. And this is the simple reasoning component of Durad, right? So this allows us to constrain uh, the output because we can only produce from that alphabet of, or like from this vocabulary of, of special um, AST uh, serialization tokens. So therefore, we can never leave that constraint space of, of, of SQL ASTs. And at the end, the SQL AST is then decoded to its surface form, so basically back to text, and we can get a result like the one shown below, right? So like we get select the thing, cases ID, and so on. So this is this is how this model sort of works. Um, of course, I brushed over it, but but this is the essence of it. All right. So this brings me actually to the end. Um, so text to SQL translation enables uh, users to talk to a database. So that's sort of the mess message I wanted to convey here. So it doesn't work perfectly yet. And of course, you want also to fine tune on your database. So that what, also, what I showed you in the demo, for instance, was a completely unseen database. 
and you would get much better results if you actually had a few training examples for that particular database and you can then quickly fine tune your model to that. Um, and DURAD is a state of the art neural uh, text to SQL model that can quickly generalize to new databases, right? So, like, um, I mean, maybe not zero shot perfectly, but with a bit of training that it can. Um, and we have published a paper about DURAD that is uh, due to appear at uh, NA NAACL uh, 2021, so pretty soon. The preprint draft is available uh, on the archive. You can find uh, the link there. And we also have published um, Durat's code. So um, if you go to GitHub and the element AI space, you will find it under Durat there. Thank you for listening. And I'm not sure if we have time for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Torsten, for your very exciting presentation. So I have quite a few questions that I have here. So I'm going to start with one question, then I'll let the audience ask the other question. So could you go back to the first first few slides that you had where you had a schema of how the com different components in your model interact with each other? It was before the architecture of the Duarad. It was like at the beginning where you had this. Yeah, this one. Uh, no, no. Could you go to the next one where you have actually the Duarad above? Okay, yeah. So the constraint decoding. Uh, so I assume this is like the Durat uh, decoder. Is it that one, or is it something different? The the reason that I'm asking this question is because I can see that the Durat is fed both the linguistic and the structural, but later on the constraint decoding also gets directly the structural aside from the one that comes from the Durat. So I'm kind of confused what this component is actually in the uh, architecture that you showed to us and why it needs to have this structural directly without the involvement of the DORAT. Oh, we don't hear you. I think you're muted. All right. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, Right, so like what's happening is that we're using, I talked about this at the end, right? So like we're using this uh, special vocabulary of, of um, control tokens, right? So like they're not uh, English or, or, or uh, SQL subword tokens, right? So like they don't make up the, 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 the string sequence of the SQL code. What they actually make up is a, a um, construction plan that when executed give you uh, an abstract syntax tree of the SQL code, right? So like if you've ever seen an abstract syntax tree, you basically have nodes and they represent sort of like, let's say um, the select statement could be could be a node and the select statement has then uh, slots, right? Um, for instance, we'll start with uh, each column that you want to select, right? And then at some point, uh, it's, from right and then in the from clause you have which is another node you will have then to to mention the tables you want to uh, select from right so and then you get like this recursive uh, tree structure uh, of nodes right and um, at some point the, the the terminating right so if you have like uh, leaf nodes in that tree and these are then the 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 literals uh, so these could for instance be things like better you come batch right so it's a string literal, but there could also be column names or, or table names. And uh, the constraint decoding takes into account this information, which comes from the schema, right? So we make sure that we cannot produce a table name or column name nodes that do not exist in the schema, right? So mm -hmm. therefore, uh, this arrow from the structural context to the constraint decoding. And we also have these errors between Durat and constraint decoding because, um, as I said, this is like an autoregressive process, right? So like you iteratively produce more and more of these tokens. And um, when you generate from like uh, a sequence to sequence model autoregressively, what happens is that um, you sort of like you produce part of the sequence, like token by token, and then you feed that to the model back, right? And then you ask the model, what's the next token? And then you either greedily select the top one, or like you use beam search and select, let's say, the top five. But you can only select those that are admitted by our uh, constraint decoder at that point in time, because 
when you let's say are in a select um, node, then the children of that node, um, so all the slots of that node, they have a certain type, right? So that they need to, uh, they can only be filled, let's say, by 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 uh, a from node or or a where node, not again by a select node, right? So like you can only produce a certain um, kind of node next, or kind of like um, token next because of that. And then what we can do is we can mask all those tokens, all these special tokens that are not admitted at this point in time, right? So um, and this is what I meant by constrained decoding. We cannot select from the whole vocabulary at any given time. We are um, constrained to a part of the vocabulary of these special tokens that are admittable at that moment of generation. And this changes from uh, token to token, which are admissible and which are not. Right? So therefore, we have this constant back and forth between the model and the constrained decoder. Does it kind of work as masking out the options that are unavailable? Yes, yeah. I see. Thank you very much. So uh, do we have questions from the audience? If there are no questions, I'm going to go with my second question, uh, which is uh, which is like a more high level question in terms of how it can be applied to a real life scenario. I was wondering, like considering that the real uh, SQL databases, they have usually like very huge schemas. How efficient is it going to be to be deployed in real life scenario if you want to feed every time the whole schema to the model? And is there like any, I mean, any like works is, that are uh, you planning so, on in doing, doing anything to kind of make it more efficient in that part? Um, so this is, I mean, we trained this on the spider data set, right? So like, and there are, okay, so like we're, we're limited by several things. So like if uh, I said we're using the bird model, the bird model, has a maximum number of 512 input tokens, right? Uh, and if you go to longer sequences, you would either have to use another model or you would have to use like a, a model that is not quadratic in the number of inputs, right? Uh, and although these models exist, we did not really spend time in, 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 in looking that way because we're not yet at a stage where we can think about integrating this into a live product. Right, because there are also considerations from the product side that are not really addressed by the spider data set. Um, because it is an academic data set, it is sort of like uh, prepping me up for the, for the day at which this technology becomes viable in a product. But um, there are many problems with it, right? So like the schemas in there are actually not that enterprisey as you would like, right? So like for instance, dates and times are not represented by um, well, by the date time type, they're represented by uh, string types individually for the day, the month, and the year, right? So, like, there are tons of problems like that. And on top of that, of course, you have the, then the restriction of input length, right? But this is the same, like, if you wanted to, let's say, do Q&A on, like, a huge document corpus, right? So, like, you would have to optimize a lot and, like, have to make, um, apply a lot of heuristics about what sort of, like, information is actually uh, the most uh, important, the most salient for answering the user's requests, right? So, for instance, in, instead of like giving the model the whole schema, maybe we can like narrow it down to like those columns and tables that are the most likely to be relevant for this particular query based on some heuristic, right? This is one way to maybe constrain or like limit the, the, the amount of stuff you have to feed to that model. But we haven't experimented with this yet. So, like, to answer the quick answer, if you have a huge schema, right? It's not possible to feed like a schema with hundreds of tables and where each column uh, for each table has like hundreds of columns to to this model because there's just a limitation on on how much data this thing can swallow. Um, but maybe there is a way to like devise smart heuristics that allow you to break this down to actually an essential core of that schema for a particular question in order to like make this work. But we haven't experimented with that. What I was mainly looking for was to try to find ways to kind of decouple the encoder for the uh... Uh, the user query and the schema so that we can kind of have the representation for the schema cached in some place, some uh, storage, and then just retrieve it and apply it to the model in the time of inference. So I was, so yeah, that's something true. that, that has a really good idea. Um, the problem with that is though that it is uh, affecting uh, performance of the model somewhat severely. Exactly. 
exactly. <laughs> yeah. So like because uh, the, 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 like the representation of the schema yeah. is not uh, does not have information from the the query itself. So like if you split this in half, right? And if you say, okay, maybe I can encode the schema first, and then uh, I encode the question later, and then the question can see the schema representation, but the schema representation cannot see the question, which sort of makes sense from like if you wanted to optimize this, right? For one of you. But the problem is this model actually works perfectly or like the best when you jointly uh, encode them, right? Where you have like this um, mutual visibility of question and schema. And if you take this away, and we have actually studied this, the impact of this, and you can find the results in our paper, you lose uh, several percentage points of performance. So it's like a significant drop. Uh, and this has to do with the fact that like BERT likes to build representations and build alignments, uh, uh, or it can only do that if, if it has like the, the, the whole context, right? And if you wanted to offload this, let's say to uh, the more the layers that are stacked on top of BERT, um, the amount of training data that is available in that data set, which is just 10,000 questions, right, is not enough to build up this sort of like um, reasoning uh, ability um, uh, sufficiently. So this is why um, uh, this is just not a good idea uh, for, for this little amount of data. I understand. Thanks. So we have a bit of time for just one last question. So if no one from the audience, ha if someone from the audience has questions, it would be the time to raise hand. Otherwise, I have my, my last question. So does anyone have any questions from the audience? If not, I'm just going to make a quick question, which is why do you like, is it is it common to only evaluate these models based on the query generated and uh, not take into account if the result of the queries that are generated are equal or not? Ah. Like I, I would say it would make more sense because based on the, the part that you mentioned that the, da the databases are not unified. So if the results yeah. are similar, it shouldn't, the system shouldn't be penalized. Yeah, so like what I cited, the 70% are in fact like exact match accuracy, right? So like what you take into account is sort of like um, you, you parse the SQL back, right, into into some sort of like um, nested representation, and then uh, with a bit of fuzziness, you co you compare sort of like are all columns there, all tables there, are they combined in the right way, um, and so on, right? So this is how this exact metric in, in the spider data set is defined. And um, there's actually code for it. So like you better use it if you want to be on that leaderboard because it's standardized, right? Um, but more recently, uh, the people who run the spider um, benchmark uh, have uh, introduced a new metric, which is based on exactly what you suggested, execution accuracy. Um, but this comes with its own problems <laughs> because um, what you have to keep in mind is that like, many of the variations of the SQL that can be produced may, even though they are not semantically equivalent to the ground truth, produce the same result, especially if the database is empty. So like if you have a completely empty database, all queries will give you the same result, meaning empty. And if you <laughs> and if you have a query that um, deviates only slightly from a, from, from a ground truth stream, uh, um, ground truth query, for instance, like instead of like, Having a filter uh, that is smaller than equal, you have a filter that is smaller, right? Exclusively smaller. Then, unless you have the data to dif uh, differentiate these two very, very, very similar queries, you won't see that you made a mistake, right? And there is a mistake. So, what they what they came up with is a uh, evaluation scheme where you have distilled databases, and they are randomly generated, but then uh, refined. Uh, that allow you to sort of distinguish the nuances between all the things that can go wrong in your production, right? So like they're, they're engineered and they have to be engineered for each individual ground through SQL expression, right? So it give you an idea of how much work there is and computational load there is, such that they can um, differentiate many variations with subtle and small uh, issues or problems or mistakes in the, in the prediction of your model, right? And uh, running this is, uh, is, is expensive and, and just takes a lot of time. Um, we have evaluated our model on that too. Um, and again, it com, com, uh, performs uh, comparatively. Um, and if you wanted to actually build a product, you better do something like that. 
but you also make sure that you do a lot of um, different ablations and, and variations on the natural language side of things, so the linguistic part of it, right? So like if you had many different phrasings of the same question that are maybe less literal and less verbose than what is inspired because the inspired questions are very verbose. So if you wanted to make that more realistic, you would uh, maybe compress the questions. So that's actually research work that does this. Uh, and analysis this. So like if you just like basically have people who are used to Google and they'll just give you keywords, right? And then the model kind of like squints and tries to figure out what this is supposed to mean. So sort of train data in spider is, uh, is is not of that kind. And if you if you if you gave Dura to actual users and they were using Google style keyword um, and they don't write complete sentences with a question mark in the end, um, then this is sufficiently out of distribution so that the results become very unreliable, right? So like what you need is actually um, a test suite, a compelling test suite that tries many variations of, uh, of, of user utterances and has paraphrasings of it. And uh, it's a lot of work um, to, to, to do that. Yeah. That makes complete sense. So we have reached the end of today's meeting. Thank you very much, Torsten, for answering the question. Once again, many thanks to Suishen, uh, Toma and Torsten for their exciting presentations for their exciting talks and many thanks to the audience for being a part of the today's event please stay tuned for the upcoming events because we'll probably have another one also next month uh, until then have, take care of yourself and enjoy your time have a great day and see you soon thank you bye thank bye. you Hisa.